decades after it was filmed, When We Were Kings remains a potent experience of Muhammad Ali. Now we pay tribute to director Leon Gast, who died last week at age 84. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Over the past week, I spoke to four people close to Leon Gast to explore the making of his best-known film about Muhammad Ali in Africa. Yeah, I'm in Africa. Yeah, Africa's my home. Damn America and what America thinks. Yeah, I live in America, but Africa's the home of the black man. And I was a slave 400 years ago, and I'm going back home to fight among my brothers. Yeah. Leon shot the film in 1974, traveling to Zaire, today the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a televised fight was staged between Ali and George Foreman. It was known as the Rumble in the Jungle. Zaire's dictator, Mobutu Sese Seko, had staked $5 million for each fighter. George Foreman was a 25-year-old powerhouse and unbeaten. Sportscasters heavily favored Foreman to beat Ali, whose best years were considered behind him. Maybe he can pull off a miracle. But against George Foreman, so young, so strong, so fearless, against George Foreman, who does away with his opponents one after another in less than three rounds, it's hard for me to conjure with that. Leon was also an underdog. He endured over 20 years of legal and financial struggles to complete the film. But he was a gambler and ready to take the odds. He began the project with an entirely different focus. He had set out to document a music festival being staged alongside the fight with top acts from Africa and the U.S. What you want? Leon planned to call the film Festival in Zaire, or Fizz, envisioned as a black Woodstock. To better understand what happened, I spoke with four people who knew Leon well. Filmmaker Barbara Koppel, When We Were Kings producer David Sonnenberg, the film's editor Jeffrey Kusama Hinti, and Leon's wife, Jerry Spolengast. Our story begins in the early 70s, when Leon is making his first documentary, Our Latin Thing featuring the Fania All-Stars. He meets Barbara Koppel in a Manhattan hangout called Good Vibrations. Just to show you sort of what Leon was like, like we went in the first time um, we really talked for a while, we went into the kitchen at um, Good Vibrations and Leon was an unbelievable gambler. And so there were (laughs) a few cockroaches there and he put down a piece of crumb on the counter and he said, okay, I'll bet you $5 that this one gets to the crumb before the other one. (laughs) I mean, he, he, he would bet on anything, but that was one of the first bets you know, we ever had. We were immediately close. We hit it off. I mean, Leon would only work with people that he could have a really good time with or something about them, you know, struck him as as something very special. He wouldn't just hire a crew that he didn't, crews that he didn't know. Because, you know, we'd all get into shenanigans together and, you know, do things we weren't supposed to and all sorts of stuff. Barbara describes New York's documentary scene. In the 1970s, we had, you know, 16 millimeter cameras, Eclairs, Aries. Um, I had a Nagra that was, you know, huge. And But when I was getting things that I loved, I didn't feel it at all. And also we helped each other. We didn't really expect pay or, you know, sometimes we were lucky. And if someone had a little budget, they'd pay. Um, I had a people's Nagra so that people could use, you know, this Nagra for free. It was very close. It was very intimate. And we all knew each other extremely well. And also because film was expensive, 
you had to really be struggling to do something, a good job. You know, you just couldn't go out there with a camera and hope maybe you would get something. It was sort of planned out. <laughs> While making our Latin thing, Leon gets to know the horn player, Willie Colon. When Leon needs a lawyer, Colon refers him to David Sonnenberg. It's the early 70s, and Leon is working on a documentary about the Hells Angels. David explains. That was, you know, an eye-opener for me. Um, I was a very young lawyer. I mean, I knew of the Hells Angels, um, but I didn't know that much about them. And um, Leon uh, was uh, kind of caught in the middle because he was he was directing the you know the movie, but the Grateful Dead had gotten the financing for this. The Grateful Dead were very close to the Hell's Angels. The Hell's Angels would sort of be the bodyguards and security for all the Grateful Dead concerts, and there were tons of Grateful Dead concerts all the time. Um, and um, I'm trying to think of the name of the Grateful Dead's, uh, oh yeah, Ron Rakow. He was the manager for the Grateful Dead. And he had gotten the financing for Angels Forever, Forever Angels from, I think it was First Boston. It was a bank in Boston. And Leon asked me, Leon, they had run out of money. He still needed to shoot. He hadn't been paid. So it was very important to him that the financing was in place. So he asked me if I would come to this meeting um, where they were meeting with First Boston and uh, the Grateful Dead, Ron Rakow was, you know, trying to arrange what was, I thought, the second round of financing, but apparently was the fourth time they were going back to this bank to get financing to complete the film, which supposedly should have been completed, like, you know, years before. Um, and um, when I went, we were maybe on the 23rd or 24th floor of an old school building. It had, you know, old fashioned windows that you could actually raise up with your hands as opposed to those hermetically sealed things. And the meeting was not going well. When I walked in, there was a guy named Sandy Alexander, who was the uh, head of the New York chapter of the Hells Angels. And by the door was this mammoth guy named Vinny, who was covered from you know head to toe in both biker's gear and whatever was showing skin-wise was covered in tattoos. And he was a frightening behemoth of a guy, big, big guy. And when I walked in, there was a lot of arguments you know, about you know, financing and the first Boston was going, you know, you said that two, two rounds ago and then last round and how are we to believe you? And this is so much over budget. The bottom line is we are not doing it. We are not financing the movie. And, you know, then the Grateful Dead said, well, then, you know, you're Ron Rackhouse. said, then you're not going to get your money back because this is a shell corporation and uh, we're not finished with the movie and the, and the angels and the, the dead are not happy with the film. The guy says, I don't care, we're not financing this film. And with that, Sandy Alexander looked over at this guy, Vinny, and Vinny got up, and I knew of him because I had seen footage of the film, and he was in the, in the film. He got up, he walked over, he grabbed one of the bankers by his ankle. Vinny was like six six or something. He turns him upside down, holds him. The guy's wearing a suit, holds him. Things are falling out of his pocket. He walks over to the window and with his other hand, he lifts up the window and nobody in the room, nobody, including Leon and myself, said a word, you know? And then finally said, okay, okay, we're gonna finance, we're gonna finance. I have no way to fact check that story. So let's keep going. Leon was a really cool guy. I mean, you know, he was about 12 years older than I was. He had a studio in Times Square. He was, a, he was a photographer, but by this point he was doing commercials. He was also doing uh, sound for records. He had a recording studio. So for me, because I was a musician and I was an entertainment lawyer and I was interested in film and theater, I just thought Leon was the coolest guy because he was young and he had a recording studio where he was recording all kinds of Latin music and he had done our Latin thing and he's involved with the Hells Angels and now he's getting a phone call to do Fizz, um, you know, a connection with, not that it was gonna have anything to do with Ali, but it was this three-day music festival before the Ali Foreman fight and, and, and Leon was also a bit of a gambler and, um, you know, was a street hustler, um, and he was a huge sports fanatic, too. So there was everything about him 
Plus, there were lots of cool girls hanging out, too. So he was my favorite client, actually, in, in the early 70s. David believes a key to Leon's success was his open personality. You know, you're talking about the Hells Angels. You're talking about the Grateful Dead, the Fania All-Stars, who were superstars, and all these Latin artists who were street people, mostly from the Bronx. And yet, Leon, and they so they were savvy, a little bit paranoid, a little wary of, you know, strangers. And here is this white Jewish boy, you know, Leon Gass coming in to get intimate with them, to have them open up, to have them be real. And he had a gift of, you know, showing that you could trust him. Um, and he was very trustworthy. You know, he was, he was cool, and he, but, but he wasn't slick. And he would be very open hearted. And um, he just had the ability to get people, you know, to let for people to allow him to get close. There are two figures crucial to the story who appear in When We Were Kings. One is the fight promoter, Don King, who controlled rights to the whole event. We left Africa in shackles and fetters and chains. You know, we're coming back in an aura of splendor and scintillating glory. The champions are here. The so we try to get the here. champions of the sports world, champions of the music world. Mm -hmm. So we put them both together and we got one champion that's so intermingled and intertwined that we are fused into one entity. The other key player is Stuart Levine, one of the concert producers who had teamed with African musician Hugh Masekela. We've been to Kinshasa. We don't know what to expect. We're going to be met by a country that expected a fight. Instead, they're going to get the greatest musical performance there ever was. It was Stuart Levine who pushed Leon to be the director. He was a horn player himself, and he loved our Latin thing. He loved the Fania All-Stars. He loved everything about that project. And he was the person who recommended Leon um, to Don King to direct what was supposed to be called Fizz, Festival in Zaire. Um, uh, both Stuart, it was really Stuart's idea to shoot um, a film. I know that King um, was looking for a big name director. Um, when Stuart came up with the idea, King had the rights to the film, you know, to, to the fight. He was promoting the fight, but he controlled the whole thing. And Stuart pitched him on the idea of bringing in financing and doing what would be the African-American Woodstock, because Woodstock was a big, big success in 69, and this was 74. And Stuart, who was very friendly with Hugh Masekela, thought that an African-American Woodstock would be great. So Stuart got all the American, you know, big name urban or R&B artists of the time. And Huey, um, being an African, had connections to all the great African artists. And uh, King ultimately said, OK, because King controlled everything. So, so Leon entered into an agreement with what we thought was a company owned by Don King called International Film and Records, but actually turned out to be um, owned by the Liberian finance minister who came up with uh, the initial <laughs> seed money to get this festival happening. Remember, this is four years after Warner Brothers released the Woodstock documentary as a huge success. So Leon's crew follows that lead. So he had filmed preparations in, you know, New York, getting the contracts together, you know, getting the musicians, you know, get to board flights, uh, getting there, getting malaria shots, travel arrangements. He also had a crew over in uh, Africa because this was put together pretty last minute. Um, watching them build, you know, Mobutu had, in addition to coming up with, you know, $5 million for each fighter, which is already an unheard of sum. I mean, no one had gotten more than a million dollars before. Um, Mobuto built a 20,000 seat stadium in, you know, for this event, you know, very, very quickly. Um, so this, the stadium was coming together and, and, and he also filmed about equipment because it was pretty tough to, you know, you're talking about, you know, it was not, it was kind of a third world uh, country at the time. Um, and it was not very prosperous. And so they had to bring in everything from, you know, lighting equipment to generators, you know, to uh, all kinds of, you know, cranes to shoot this. Um, I mean, it was a massive undertaking and it was not easy to get things to Kinshasa. So that's what the film was all about. And it was really like filming Woodstock, only, you know, the African-American version. In the days leading up to the main event in Zaire, an accident happens with lasting effects for Leon. 
It was kind of fortuitous because he was told very specifically, listen, you're not filming the fighters. The rights to the fight are with somebody else. Um, you don't have the right to include any fight footage in the movie. They have exclusive rights to, you know, the fight for television and whatnot. So don't even think about that. It's just, you know, preparation. About maybe five or six days before the fight, um, Leon had, um, they had wrapped for the day and he had a one cameraman just with him and he was walking by the training facility where Foreman was training and he walked in and just because he couldn't help himself, he told the cameraman to start to shoot and they shot some footage of Foreman cornering people walking around the ring. And then quite by accident, a guy, because Foreman was not really, you know, sparring very hard. He was really practicing his footwork. Um, a guy got a little frightened but from, you know, by Foreman and, and the sparring partner. He reached up with his elbow and caught Foreman in the eye. And Leon got that cut with the blood. And Dick Sadler, who was Foreman's manager, went running in the ring, very concerned. He came out, you saw the blood on the towel. Um, and Leon got that. And then within 48 hours, the fight was postponed for six weeks. And I was in New York. And Leon called me and said, listen, you should speak to Don King because I think Mobutu is quarantining the fighters. I don't think he's allowing them to leave the country. They're going to have to stay here for six weeks. If King would allow me to keep a stripped down um, camera crew after the festival, because oh, you know, for the next four days, they continued to shoot preparations for the festival. The, the, the music festival happened on time because these fighters had I mean, the, the artists like James Brown, B.B. King and the Spinners and Etta James, they all had pay or play deals and they had other bookings, you know, after this. So they were going to perform and it was three nights of the music festival and Leon filmed it. First night, nobody was in the place at all because who, no one flew into Zaire because the fight had been canceled. And the people who lived in Zaire, the tickets were, I think, 15 or $20. I don't think people made that in a year working in Zaire. So the first two nights, there was nobody there. He filmed with the 10-man camera, 10 camera crew, you know, the four-hour concerts on those first two nights. The third night, Mobutu let everybody and anybody in for free from the country. And it was packed. It was like 100,000 people jam-packed in there, and they shot that as well. But then afterwards, he said, see if King would allow me to keep a camera crew here. And I think I think the budget was $150,000 for him to stay there and basically follow the fighters around, you know, Africa, because Leon thought, hey, maybe this music film will be that much more, you know, interesting if I could get some of that footage. And King had, you know, King was over there. He sent me a telegram confirming that he'd pay $150,000. And Leon stayed there with the stripped down crew. But Leon still doesn't think he's making a fight film. Leon just thought culturally, um, since Ali was going to be, you know, confined there, plus there were several people, like some of the members of the Fania All-Stars and some of the band members who didn't have other gigs, they stayed on. And Ali actually recorded um, some original songs. He wanted to get a record deal. Um, that's a whole other story because I ended up becoming his lawyer for a brief period of time. But Leon filmed all of this, this stuff on the deal that we had made with King for $150,000. Leon comes back and learns that Don King has sold the rights to a London-based company called International Film and Records. We did a search globally, and we finally came up with a Cayman Islands Corporation. And we saw that the owner of the Cayman Islands Corporation was a guy named Steve Talbot who was the finance minister from Liberia. And he was killed within a couple of days or a couple of weeks after the fight in some kind of military coup. Um, I suspect that he must have felt that he had an opportunity to take $5 million of Liberian currency and make a private deal for himself to own what, I guess he must have been hyped by Don King. This is gonna be like Woodstock, you'll own this movie. I don't know what King got from, from Talbot to, to buy him out. Um, but then I started an action in the Cayman Islands um, against international film and records. 
Nobody appeared. So we got a judgment. They defaulted. We got a $150,000 judgment. And then Leon had 400 hours worth of film in New York. We had to bring it all down uh, to the sheriff's office in New York. And, you know, whenever you do a public auction sheriff sale, you have to make, you know, do a public notice for, I think, six weeks announcing what you have, all the footage from the Ali Foreman fight, blah, 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 you know, James Brown, B.B. King, well, you know, have to list everything you have. And then the day of the auction, nobody showed up. So we bid $1,000 against our $150,000 judgment, and Leon was awarded ownership of everything. Uh, About maybe a month or two later, um, one of my clients who I was managing, Meatloaf, started to get some traction, and I stopped practicing law. I gave Leon a hug, and I said, I'm becoming a manager, and off I went, and I didn't hear from him until almost, I would say, 14 years later. Fast forward to 1989. Leon gets back in touch. David says it's like time stood still. Leon has never stopped looking for financers to no avail. David thinks about Chris Blackwell, who had made a fortune with his company, Island Records. So this was 1989. He had sold Island Records to Polygram. And I think I think he got ninety million dollars, which in nineteen eighty nine felt like you know ninety billion dollars. And I said, you know, I know he loves you know because he he had a, he had a film company and he also had Island Records, but he loved Island music. He loved African music. Island Island put out a lot of African music. And I said, Leon, you have like thirty famous African artists. You have all these you know you got James Brown, BB King, all these incredible American artists. Plus, you got a film, you know, involving Muhammad Ali. You shot all this footage on Ali. Um, I'm going to call him. So I called him and he said, look, I'm leaving for Tahiti. I think I called him on a Tuesday. He said, I'm leaving for Tahiti on a Saturday. I'm going to be coming down from, you know, north of the city. I could stop at your office and look at some footage. So I said to Leon, do you have some footage? And he said, I need you to give me some money. I'll transfer some stuff, you know. So I, I put up $5,000 and Leon transferred about five or six hours worth of, of 400 hours worth of film. And um, in that five hours was a scene where Ali goes, if you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I kick Foreman's behind. And by this point in time, 1989, Ali's voice was already becoming quieter. You know, he was ill. Um, and so this was like, you know, Ali, as you remembered him, you know, at, from, from, so I was really excited. And when, um, when Blackwell came to the office and saw it, he went crazy. And then when he saw all the, you know, names of the artists that we had, he goes, what are you looking for? And Leon and I were already decided that, you know, if, because we knew he was going to want to own it, you know, so we came up with a number, I believe the number, in fact, I'm sure the number was $3 million for everything all these African records, all these American records, um, which, which they had rights for, and then, you know, a completed film. So he goes, look, I'm going to Tahiti. Um, I'm going to get you a ticket. I want you to fly to London. And um, when you get there, you talk to my solicitors, we'll make a deal. I'm into it. And he went off. I went to England and I met with these guys. There were six Englishmen, very proper. I used to think I was a proper lawyer, but I was not quite as proper as, <laughs> as these guys. And they asked me, they, well, do you have a release from Muhammad Ali? I said, no, but he's a public figure. And, you know, well, what about the fight? I said, no, well, well the fight we'd have to, to, you know, we weren't even, to, let me take it back. We weren't even thinking about the fight because this was fizz. This was just festival on Zaire with this cultural stuff. So, so I said, they said, do you have the copyright? I said, well, we have ownership, you know. We have, uh, we did a sheriff sale and they said, well, in the UK, if you didn't file against the copyright, you'll have, you don't have the rights. You own it. You could take a bath with all that footage, but you can't exploit it in, in England without officially having levied against the copyright. So I said, well, that's not how the law is in America, but it, why don't you make up a shopping list of all the things you need me to do to satisfy you that I have the rights? And once we have it, if at the end of the rainbow, there's $3 million, we're going to make a deal. So they said, okay. And they sent a telegram 
off to Blackwell, who was in, in Tahiti still, and basically said, we met with Sonnenberg. He doesn't have this. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have the copyright, you know. Um, and Blackwell sent back a telegram, which he copied me on. It goes, Zaire project sounds like nightmare. Stop. Proceed. So I thought that was the greatest telegram I ever saw. And I loved Chris Blackwell. He was totally cool. So we started to try to put things together. But unfortunately, um, when he got back, he said that he really, Leon wanted the right to really make this movie the way he felt it should be made. And he wanted real control over it. And Blackwell wasn't prepared to give him, you know, that kind of control and um, said, look, three million is a lot of money. And to be frank, Leon really needed some money. And I said, Leon, I think you should let this guy, you directed it, let him have his way with this. And he said, no, no, man, you put up the money. You, it's only gonna cost $250,000. I said, look, I'm not putting up any money. Um, I think you should take it. He said, I'm not gonna make the deal. And he didn't make the deal. Throughout these ups and downs, Leon takes jobs on other people's films. And he meets Jerry, who he'll spend the rest of his life with. Leon had been friends with her late husband. I met him once while my husband was alive. He, he died in 89. Um, and Leon did the eulogy at his funeral. And he just, you know, he called a couple of times just to make sure I was okay and my daughter was okay. And he took us out to dinner. And um, uh, the rest is history. I, you know, um, I, I would check up on him and we actually had our first date about nine months after my husband died. And, uh, and then that was it. Ultimately, I moved into his apartment with him and it was a two bedroom and the, the second bedroom had all his editing equipment uh, the, uh, you know, the video, every three quarter inch video stuff, uh, boxes and tapes all over the place. It was so, you know, you could always hear that the sound of him fast forwarding, rewind, fast forwarding, getting to that, getting to that one spot, you know, making an edit, you know, it, it, he was always thinking about it. It was really who he was. He was a documentary filmmaker. After turning down the deal with Chris Blackwell, Leon moves his editing equipment to an upper floor of David Sonnenberg's townhouse. One day, um, I actually was up looking at some of what Leon was doing, and uh, Wyclef Jean, who was one of the members of the Fugees, which was a group that I managed, came up and he saw Ali on one of these monitors and he goes, yo man, that's Muhammad Ali. He's the original rapper. And suddenly I realized how big it was. And, I, and, it, and it seemed true to me that Ali was the original rapper. I mean, you know, he was always talking poetry. He was always, you know, making rhymes and he wasn't putting it to music, but, but he was rapping. And I said to Leon, I went, why are we making you know, a movie called Fizz, when we could make a movie about Muhammad Ali, I said, I haven't seen the footage, but you told me you have like 40 hours of just Ali rapping about everything under the sun. And he said, yeah, we'll call it Rumble in the Jungle. And I thought that was a pretty cool title. And so we're going, okay, it's the Rumble in the Jungle, and it's going to be the Muhammad Ali story. And I took a much more active interest in it at that point. Jeffrey Kusama Hinti, was an editor in his 20s when Leon asked him for help. Leon pitched it as a job for a couple of weeks that turned into several years. The first memory I have of him was we went up to his apartment and um, in the Upper West Side and he opened up a closet and essentially it was top to bottom in hundreds of three quarter inch videotapes. Um, this is after he said it would take a week or two, you know, um, and when he opened that closet door, I really quickly realized that this is a whole other uh, adventure that I was um, being roped into. And I was young. I was just starting this editor. I was in my, I guess, 20s. And um, uh, so it was incredibly exciting. And I, uh, at that time, you're just down for any experience that, you know, life will give you. And basically what he had at that time was 
they did have a finished cut of the film or he made many cuts over the years, the dec two decades that intervened. But one thing that, where I think he really got stuck is he had edited these incredible and beautiful scenes, many of which are essentially directly in When We Were Kings, but he could never reconcile the sort of the boxing story and the story of the concert. You know, when they went there, the whole design was to just have a concert film. In order to build out the fight, the filmmakers brought in Taylor Hackford. His directing credits included An Officer and a Gentleman and a documentary on Chuck Berry. Hackford expanded on the Ali Foreman story by conducting interviews with Norman Mailer and George Plimpton, who witnessed the bout in Zaire. He also interviewed Spike Lee. These kids today will be missing a whole lot if they don't know about the legacy of Muhammad Ali because no matter what era you live in, you see very few true heroes. You know, Taylor Hackford, when he came onto the project, he was brought on by both Leon and David Sonnenberg, the producer, because there was a sense that it just they needed to find another dimension in the in the footage and the project in order to really reach an audience. And I think Taylor really brought that sensibility. And as far as I know, it was his idea to do those interviews. And he he was the interviewer, you know, I know that. Um, and we built, you know, real sequences around that. And, you know, in some ways, I my heart is in the verite approach, but I completely appreciate what they were able to do with that more you know, kind of a hybrid, you know, it still wasn't talking heads in the sense that you have sort of experts opining. These were people other than Spike Lee who had experienced it. And one could venture to say that Spike Lee had a different, but a series of direct experiences which he brought to it as well. Um, and we built particularly the fight. And I have to say it was a really remarkable um, process, but Taylor had really imagined the fight as it inter, as it related to the, um, the the interviews in a very specific way, and I think that you know he really imagined that and really brought it out. Um, but he worked with us for a couple weeks, I think I, I don't recall the exact dates, and then it was put back onto Leon and myself to kind of um, kind of rebalance the film, and we sort of brought we really accentuated the more kind of soulful rhythmic part of it, you know? So I would say that the fight was pretty much, um, you know, I think Taylor really, that, that was his vision for it, but in coming back and making the entire film, it was really a lot of work to find the right balance between the, the more expository narrative driven elements and then creating the mood and the feeling, um, which is, certainly where Leon excelled, and it was my interest as well. The film's opening title sequence is scored to a live drum solo in Zaire, intercut with archival footage of Ali's early years. People do say I'm cocky. Some say I need a good whooping. Some say I talk too much. But anything that I say, I'm willing to back up. Jeffrey says this is pure Leon. What, what Leon really excelled at is having these kind of musical sequences and bringing the verite footage into it, because he just loved doing that. And he really had a great imaginative sense about how to bring it together. David remembers advocating for the title, When We Were Kings. And there were a lot of kings involved. You know, Don King was the king, and James Brown was the king of soul, and Mobutu was the king of Zaire, and Ali was the king of the world. And even Mailer and Plimpton and Stokely Carmichael and, you know, Miriam McKeeba, they, all these people were at the top of their game. With the film finished, it was set to premiere at Sundance in January 1996. You know, we were accepted into Sundance, right? And particularly at that time, it was incredibly exciting for everybody. And we were behind schedule finishing. You know, we were, we had to do a lot of, um, you know, everything was done in an analog way. So making a 35 millimeter print from the 16 and that was time consuming and the mix was time consuming. And instead of shipping out the print, Leon decided that he was going to carry the print um, because that, you know, that's something that people did do. And 
he um, decided that he was to be the one to do it. And I had actually gone out a couple of days before because I had worked on some other things and just kind of to lay the groundwork. So it, it started in a very inauspicious way whereby the taxi he was in going over, you know, um, the Triborough Bridge um, broke down, you know. All of his uh, luggage was put on the side of the road, including the film, which wasn't in canisters, but in a box and the cardboard box fell apart, you know, so he's hauling the film rolls. Um, and then um, he gets to the airport and he was on that ill-fated flight, which you may have heard about, which struck a bird. Essentially, the flight had to turn back, you know, it didn't go. And we were cutting it right to the um, right to the limit and we missed our premiere at Sundance. Um, we had to cancel it, and it was just incredibly nerve-wracking and and intense. And, and actually, I'd been there before when you know, when you could still do this, putting posters all over Sundance. We had these great posters that were made. So they reorganized a um, screening. Um, Leon finally got there, and we had to medicate him. He was so anxious, and he was so um beside himself you know he hadn't slept for days and the film was late but we managed to get a new screening and i met him at the airport and brought the film so they could join it together and they used to put those in those massive single reels um and we went to the screening and it's an odd room it's not a wasn't a movie theater and literally we screened the film people were you know overjoyed i mean it was a because people knew nothing about the film, who, who could. We were the only ones who had seen it. And the first thing, literally amidst the applause of this audience, Leon turns to me and says, well, what do you, do you think they like it? And I'm like, Leon, they love your movie. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> but even, even while he was awash in the adulation, he still couldn't see it. And it just had been, if you think about it, it had been decades coming, you know. Leon's wife, Jerry, remembers it as an emotional time. It was, in a sense, bittersweet because here he was getting all these great accolades. It was just a brilliant film. People were loving it, but it was over. It was done. And he actually, before we went to the premiere, he cried because it was now, it's almost like it wasn't his baby anymore. It was done, that was it. And it had taken so many years of his life and meant so much to him. And he actually wept. Um, boy, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Gath died on March 8th at age 84. I want to thank my guests, Barbara Koppel, David Sonnenberg, Jeffrey Kusama Hinti, and Jerry Spolin Gast for speaking with me. When We Were Kings is now streaming on Showtime and available on Blu ray from Criterion. There are many more stories to be told about Leon Gast and When We Were Kings, so allow me four final points. Number one, Leon went on to make other films, including Smash's Camera, about the controversial paparazzo Ron Galella that won a directing prize at Sundance. Take the First Amendment to its furthest point, then you have Ron sitting there protected by it. I think of him as a stalker. He was like a kid. What did I do that was so wrong? I just took pictures. Now people are eating these pictures up. He's an artist. He's an icon. He's the price tag of the First Amendment. He was a gentleman. Selfish. Free. Despicable. He's a national treasure. Number two. A decade after When We Were Kings came out, Jeffrey Kusama Hinti got permission from Leon to reopen the archives and cut a new film, Soul Power, that put the focus back on the music festival in the spirit of Leon's original plans. Soul Power premiered at the Toronto Film Festival in 2008 and is available on Amazon. Number three. 
Number three. For decades in documentary film, black stories were dominated by white storytellers. There's a growing scrutiny of that history, and our show notes contain links for further reading. The context I want to underscore is that black filmmakers were available to make those films all along. I'm thinking of directors active in the 1970s, such as Henry Hampton, St. Clair Bourne, and William Greaves. All of them are gone now, but each had touch points with Muhammad Ali. Henry Hampton has a section in Eyes on the Prize about Ali. St. Clair Bourne was a unit production manager on When We Were Kings. And William Greaves directed the documentary The Fight about a match between Ali and Joe Frazier in 1971. That film is currently being restored, and I plan to focus on Greaves in an upcoming episode. Number four, I want to give the final words to Barbara Koppel, describing a gift she got from Leon. And I remember he gave me a poster of um, Ali, which I put into my office, and it's still there to this day. And it's this big poster, and you just see these beautiful brown eyes, and under it says, when we were kings. And, and when I would look at it, I would always think about Leon, and I would always think about the struggle that he went through in working. I mean, it took him 22 years to make that film. And so whenever I'm feeling down and out, even today, because things aren't going how I would like them, I think about him when I look up at that poster. It just gives me spirit and inspiration, and it was something really incredible. That's our show. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at THOM Powers. You can read our show notes and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Hey.